example, a couple children found an eagle out in the woods and it was wounded. And when they found that there was no mother or father eagle nearby, they decided that they would make it their own. Now the young girl couldn't speak, but the boy was very vocal. And so they decided through a lot of his vocal urgings to take the eagle to a special meadow. And in this meadow, they fed the eagle, they bandaged it, and they helped it to grow stronger, they helped to heal it. They came into the meadow one morning and they found the eagle standing on a stump, stretching and flexing its wings. And when they approached, he bowed to them and told them that it was time to go. And both of them were absolutely amazed because they didn't know much about eagles, but they knew that eagles didn't speak to people, much less children. But the eagle told them that the people in their village had found out about them and thought that they spent too much time with them, and so were intended to come and take them, take them away from them the next morning. And he said it was time for him to return anyway, back to the land of the eagles. But the boy and the girl were so crushed at this that they asked, couldn't we go with you? The eagle kind of smiled and said, no, because I have to fly through the heart of the sun itself. And they begged and they begged, and finally the eagle gave them the night to think about it and said that if they truly wished to make this journey, that they should meet him there before the sun comes up. The next morning they make their way into this meadow and there's the eagle flexing and loosening up his shoulders for his long journey. And as the children approach, he bows to them yet again. And this time he asks them, are you ready? And they say, yes. And he invites them to climb around on his back. And as they climb on his back, he looks back at them. He says, remember, this is a long, long journey and you may never be able to return again. It's not a dangerous journey, but we will fly through the heart of the sun. They both just shook their head, completely ready for this journey. And the eagle squatted, and he began to flap those tremendous wings, and he began to lift and rise. And at first it didn't look like he was going to be able to carry the two, but inch by inch he began to circle upwards until he was about treetop level. And about that time, the boy and the girl look down and they see the villagers coming through the woods. And they get so excited, they're laughing because they knew they got away, they knew their eagle was safe, and their voices carry down to the villagers coming through the woods, and they look up and they see the young boy and the young girl on the back of the eagle, and they start hollering and shouting, but by that time the eagle had carried them so high that they had disappeared forever. And before long, the eagle disappeared into the heavens and began to fly directly toward the sun. And as he approached the sun, he looked back at the two of them, and he said, close your eyes. And they closed their eyes and he passed through the heart of the sun. And when he came out the other side, he opened his eyes and they looked around and there were thousands of eagles soaring and screeching around them. And they looked down and they saw this beautiful green earth beneath them and the sky was a golden color. And slowly the one whose life they'd saved began to circle down and he landed softly in the grasses beneath them. And the two slid off. Then all the other eagles dropped out of the sky and formed a circle around them. And they were so excited, and together all the eagles bowed to them. And then the one whose life they had saved stepped forward. And as he stood before the boy and the girl, he took his wing and he brushed it, pushing his beak back. And they saw that this wasn't an eagle at all, but an eagle's head mask. And he shrugged his shoulders and the suit of feathers dropped off. And they saw that this wasn't an eagle, this was a spirit person and that this wasn't the land of the eagles, this was the land of the spirit people. Then all the other eagles brushed back their eagles' head mask and they shrugged off their suit of feathers. And the children were amazed. And the eagle whose life they had saved stepped forward and he looked at the two and he said, in time, my young friends, we will make for you your own suit of feathers, we will make for you your own eagle's head mask, and we will teach you how to fly. And for the next year and a day, it was the happiest they'd ever been. And they got their suit of feathers and their eagle's head mask, and they spent their days just soaring in the heavens. At the end of that year and a day, the boy gets an idea, being a little bit impulsive. Wouldn't it be great to go back to the village now? They'd love us. We're eagle people. We can fly. We're special. The little girl just shook her head, wishing that she could speak to tell him no, 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 and get very serious about this. But the boy began to talk about it more and more. And the more he talked about it, the more he began to convince the young girl to do this. So they got up early one morning and they put on their suit of feathers and their eagle's head mask and they took to the sky. And before long they passed through the heavens and they flew directly toward the sun. And when they passed through the sun and came out the other side, they were circling their village. 
and the people were just waking up and lighting their morning fires, and they saw the shadows of these two magnificent birds circling on the ground, and they looked up and they saw these beautiful eagles overhead, and they woke everyone up because they knew that this was a sign, this was something magnificent. And slowly, the two began to soar down, and all the villagers just watched them, and then the two landed in their midst. And they stood there for a moment just enjoying it, and then the boy and the girl looked at each other, and then together, they brushed back their eagle's head mask, and they shrugged off their suit of feathers. <sighs> and the crowd was absolutely amazed. These weren't eagles, this was the young boy and the young girl. And they were absolutely astonished at this. But they'd no sooner taken off their suit of feathers and their mask, and it turned to dust and fell at their feet. And they were so shocked at this that they didn't know what to do. But the villagers were just making a tremendous fuss over them. Show us how you flew. This is magnificent. This is wonderful. It's a great sign. And they looked at each other. And they looked at the dust at their feet. And they didn't know what to do. And because they didn't know what to do, they did nothing. And when they did nothing, the mood of the crowd began to change. And someone in the back said, this is evil. This is bad magic. We can't have this. And someone else started to shout, and someone picked up a stick and threw it. And the two of them turned, and they ran to the woods. And the only thing that saved them was that they knew the woods better than any of the villagers had ever known it. And the villagers hunted and hunted, and they hid and hid. After a week, the villagers gave up their chase. But the two knew that they could never return. And so they decided to make one last visit to the meadow. And they walked into the meadow and they saw the cage where they had kept the young eagle whose life they had saved. And they looked up into the tree and they still, still saw a few threads of the bandage that they had put upon him. And both their eyes went to the sky, hoping that they'd see their friend, but it was empty. And they just plopped on the ground and sat there for the longest time, staring at the earth. And then the girl's heart jumped a little bit. And she raised her eyes, and it jumped again, and she saw a tiny speck far off in the heavens. And the boy felt her heart jump the second time, and he looked at her, and he looked at her looking up, and that speck began to circle down. And as it began to reach treetop level, they saw it was the one whose life they had saved. And they both jumped up, and the eagle landed on a tree limb high above them, and the boy's going, yes, we can go back, we can go back, and the girl's crying tears of joy. And the eagle shakes his head and says, no. I'm sorry, my young friends, but you can never return. But you did save my life. And because you saved my life, there is still yet something that I can give you. And he reached in under his wing, and he dropped a flute out from under it into the hands of the girl. And he looked at her, and he said, with this flute, you will learn to speak. Because with the sound that you make from it, it will call the wind. And on the wind that you call, I will be able to fly from the other side of the sun, but it will only bring me no closer than the heavens above you. Then he turned and he looked at the boy, and he reached in under his other wing and he dropped a rattle into the hands of the boy. And he looked at him and he said, with this rattle, I will teach you a new rhythm, and I will come to you at night when you're sleeping, and I will sing you a song. So that when your friend calls me on the wind, it will be that rhythm and that song that comes to you in your sleep that will call me out of the skies into this tree to where I now stand. And only when the two of you are able to do this together will I give you the last gift I have to give you. I will teach you the language of animals. I will teach you how to talk with nature. And before they could respond, the eagle took to the sky and disappeared. And the girl's looking at her flute, no idea how to make it sound. The boy's looking at the rattle thinking, this is a baby's toy. But that night when they slept, the sound of the flute came to the girl in her dreams. And the eagle came to the boy and sang him a song. And he heard the sound of the rattle. And when they woke up, they knew that what their friend had told them was true. And they began to practice trying to bring those sounds out of the sleep. And a week passed, and the girl woke up early and she could hear she knew her young friend was curled around his rattle. She could hear him mumbling that dream song that was being sung to him in his sleep. She reached over, still holding on to those sounds that had come to her in her own dreams. She brought the flute up, and she got her first sound. 
and a breeze brushed across her. And the boy woke up. And they realized they were closer. The boy had the sound of the rattle. And they began to work even harder to bring that sound out of the dreams. And another week passed and the girl woke up early and she could hear her friends rattle moving in his sleep. And she could hear him mumbling that dream song that was being sung to him. And she reached over and she grabbed the flute and she began to play it. And the breeze began to blow across her and the boy began to whisper that song that had been sung to him. And his eyes popped open. He knew he had the words. And both their eyes went to the sky above and they saw far off a tiny speck. And the breeze grew steady as the girl continued playing. And the boy looked up and he began to sing directly to the eagle that song that the eagle had sung to him from his sleep. And slowly the eagle began to descend and he landed in that tree right above them. And he bowed to them yet again. And he said, you have learned well, my young friends. But today the lessons truly begin. Because from this day forth, I will teach you the language of animals. I will teach you how to talk with nature. From the dawn of history, the unicorn has mystified humankind. A quite beautiful creature believed to possess extraordinary powers. The unicorn has, for thousands of years, been a symbol of gentleness, magic, and fertility. The unicorn has been revered by many cultures for its ability to heal and feared for its strength and power. Within the minds and ears of humans, the uncanny ability for the unicorn to capture our imaginations has never faded for any great length of time. Nowadays, most people perceive the unicorn as merely a horse with a strange horn protruding from the top of its head. However, its magical appearance has been described in many ways around the world. The unicorn has been confused with many other animals such as the antelope, the goat, the rhinoceros, and the oryx. Typically unicorns have been depicted as having white bodies and red heads with horns, varying from silver to rainbow hues. They have always been described as having elephant's feet and as having a silky beard, although not always. Unicorns are known to fly with or without wings. Some unicorns are fierce, while others are completely tranquil. Although endowed with unusual and often magical properties through the ages, it is the unicorn's resemblance to familiar animals in nature that raises many of the doubts, casting shadows upon its being a mere fanciful creation. These similarities to known animals fuel our fascination and raise a multitude of questions. Could there have been such an animal? If the unicorn's existence is possible, could its amazing qualities be possible as well? such an animal still exist? And if so, what is it really like? What strange qualities does it really have? Can its horn truly heal? What common threads run through unicorn teachings around the world? If only an archetypal symbol, what can that symbol teach us? Is there a true unicorn treasure? Where is the unicorn found? How do we begin the search? When we study what has been spoken and written about unicorns throughout the ages, we find common threads. When this phenomenon of common threads occurs in societies that have no contact with each other, it should make little bells go off. It says we have something magnificent going on, something wonderful and universal something we should be paying attention to. Well, the hunt of the unicorn is tied very strongly to the sacred quest. We often find, especially within Europe, that there was a tremendous amount of interest in the unicorn, partly because typhoid was spreading so rampantly throughout Europe, 
and they were looking for something that could serve as a cure. And since the unicorn is the alicorn, the horn of this wondrous animal had the capability of counteracting any poisons and healing anything that it came in contact with, there was a tremendous amount of hunting of any animal that has had a single horn or anything that was even similar. And so there was a great slaughter of narwhals. There was a great slaughter of rhinoceros. Even that wonderful mystic that's become so popular in more modern times, Hildegard de Bingen, promoted the killing and the slaughtering of these animals because teaching that every aspect of this of the animal we call the unicorn could serve as a healing to make belts from it and to use its horn and every aspect of it could be used for healing and so it promoted that idea of hunting down the unicorn but the hunt of the unicorn is the hunt for our lost childhood our lost sense of wonder and we need to keep that and when we find that lost sense of wonder then we find that the healing begins to return the lady and the unicorn is actually part of the whole tradition of associating the unicorn with women and it was often believed that the only way to capture a unicorn was to place a virgin out where the unicorn is likely to trespass and some traditions taught that it had to be a it had to be a virgin some said that it did not it just had to be someone that was pure of heart Hildegard de Bingen believed and promoted the idea that it wasn't just important that it be a virgin, but it had to be a well-born virgin. Um, considering she was very well-born, this was kind of probably self-serving. But it also promoted the idea of bringing the male and the female together. And we would often find within a lot of the artwork, within the tapestries, within paintings, you will often see the unicorn depicted with its hand, with the hand of the woman upon the the horn of the unicorn, the alicorn, a very phallic, a very sexual kind of gesture. And so we had the male and the female coming together. But it also had more of a Christian connotation too. We often saw the unicorn being representative of Jesus. And so they would often depict the Madonna, Mary, cut cradling and holding a unicorn as well. So the combination of the male and the female, again, often depicted the lady with the unicorn, the child with the unicorn, constantly the male and the female coming together. In ancient China, a unicorn would appear at the time of a benevolent rain, or in the dreams of a mother who would give birth to a special child. Its appearance always foretold good fortune and happiness. In India, the unicorn appeared in the epic tale, the Mahabharata. In Persia, the Karkadon, or unicorn, was ferocious and powerful enough to kill an elephant. The Greek historian Zitzius wrote of the unicorn in his bestiary. Aristotle spoke of two types of unicorns. Julius Caesar, in his conquest of Gaul, told of unicorns living in the Hycernian forest of Germany. Other Greek and Roman writers spoke of unicorns as well, including Pliny, Physiologus, and Aelian. Marco Polo was one of the first explorers to report about the unicorn, but by the 16th century, the unicorn was known throughout Europe. King John II of Portugal spoke of the unicorn, but with Christian overtones. Although the unicorn was always a sign of good fortune and healing, the Middle Ages and Renaissance saw a rise in the unicorn's popularity, and today it still has ties to the history of both Scotland and England. Reports of the unicorn's appearance in America have also occurred. In the 16th century, it was reported in Florida, along with reports of tigers and lions. In the 17th century, Dr. Olfer Dapper in northern Maine reported unicorns along the Canadian border. Around the world, the unicorn has been treated both as a natural phenomenon and as a sacred symbol. Called by many names, described in many bestiaries, and honored in many tales and myths, the unicorn has been associated with great figures throughout history, and its presence is found in most major religions. It is even mentioned in the Christian Bible seven times. being promoted in our lives, I think it can be promoted and be utilized in several very, very dynamic ways. I think just the focus upon it as a healing image causes some very gentle healing and nurturing within our lives. 
I think the focus upon it too can help us to define and open up for us doors that we wouldn't think would have been open otherwise. One of the exercises I provide in there is an exercise called the Holy Quest. And the meditation will elicit opportunities in the week to two weeks following performing this exercise to give you the opportunity to open some new doorways, whether you choose to actually take up on those opportunities, but the opportunities will present themselves. The unicorn teaches us that we can use gentleness in tremendous ways. It was an animal that was considered the gentlest of the creatures, but also could be one of the most ferocious if it needed to be, and learn, teaches us how to combine the two. The question as to whether the unicorn is a natural phenomenon or a sacred symbol is difficult to resolve. The truth, as in most things, lies somewhere between. I know what the truth is, but I can only provide guidelines for others seeking their own truths. Such quests are always the same, and yet each is different. The unicorn lives at the edges of our mind, where our more primal instincts wait to be awakened. It also lives in the real world, in special places where everything always remains a little wild and primitive. Edges and borders and places of great power and mystery, places of encounter. As you seek out the unicorn, remember, the unicorn must never be exploited or its magic is lost. And although it can never be tamed, it delights in the gentle pursuit. For those who seek, the unicorn will become more than an abstraction. You will soon realize that when a creature is chosen to symbolize an abstract principle, its characteristics demonstrate this principle in a very real way. You will remember how to believe once more. You will recall a time when you did not need to practice to believe. You will grow to realize the world is still enchanted and that the unicorn lives.